आज के द्वितीय प्रथम सत्र में जो आर्टिस्टिक क्रिएटिव प्रेजेंटेशन है वो हमारे मध्य में प्रस्तुत करेंगी कोरिया से पधारी हुई कलाकार डॉम योन को Thanks so much for inviting me to have the chance to present about uh, the the word and images and how this kind of juxtaposition of word and image has been pursued by the artists globally and particularly women in South Korea. And this is a really wonderful time for me to introduce to some of the very important artworks in modern and contemporary Korean art. And I'm really kind of pleased and honored to have a have this presentation. And let me move on to the next page. Next, this is a table of contents, which means the first is the letters, words, and images, and transcultural perspective. To you know, to begin with, a very some of the well-known example in the history of war, history of art. Particularly from the Western perspective, then I moved to the letters, image, and words in modern and contemporary Korean art, and then I moved to uh, the four important artists participating this year, this year's of Time Korea Art Summit 2022. Again, is really I do appreciate your warm welcome yesterday, and I will use this time to present. About not whole aspects, but one aspect of these these four great South Korean artists participating in this project. The next, uh, is it fine? I never really, you know, no, should no, I take up? No, it just looks looking good. Okay, great. I never have this kind of <laughs> made, you know, <laughs> uh, appearances, but any event. Uh, These two are very important artworks in the history of art, certainly written by the Western perspective. One on the left is Marinetti, Italian futurist poet, and one on the right is by um, Guillaume Apollinaire, the French poet who also wrote the book Cubist and its painter, Cubist of Painters, one of the earliest books that devoted on Cubist of Painters. So the, we have to look at these wonderful words to realize how the juxtaposition between word and images is important to understand the beginning of modernism. Of course, the literary figures wanted to revolutionize poetry, the poetry tradition in the Western Hemisphere during the early 20th century. They wanted to revolutionize and to make it more energizing. On the left, Marinetti termed his own poem as a noise poem, which means the poetry that should reflect the really, you know, conflicting and loud, dynamic atmosphere of the urban context during the early 20th century, and then he used it whole. Letters, right? This alphabet letters for wrong purposes, not representing certain ideas, but rather use it as it is, like a pictogram. It's like a, the very visually stimulating uh, some arrangement. And on the right, you can see that Bolinera's very famous poem titled "Point 22" from his book Caligram. He was certainly inspired by calligraphy. Of course, we are really familiar with the calligraphy, which is the way of using letters, not to convey meanings, but of course it can do function, but to to arrange it visually to stimulate our eyes. On the next page, then I realize there's another really interesting example. One on the left from Joseon Dynasty. It's a late Joseon Dynasty. On the right. Its most recent media art installation, uh, the Yun Cho Kim, has represented the Korean pavilion for this year's Venice Biennial. So this is a long temporal uh, disparity. But again, if 
the tip of you know, Molinera and Marinetti uh, during the early 20th century kind of pursued the juxtaposition of word and images to, in a way, defunctionize, to make defunctionize the letters. Then we can see another interesting aspect of using word and images. On the left, this very famous Joseon painter in the tradition of Sumo or Satsuwa, which called the Munhima, wrote his poem on the left. The poem actually says, you know, in the very, very surgery, June, by just listening the sounds of uh, falling waters, he can just feel really cool. So there's no such thing as acoustic elements, but again, not so much different from Marinette's poetry, it brings up the sound. What's interesting thing about this, the image and word juxtaposition, that this type of experimentation really, really opened the horizon for visualize. The visual began to incorporate the sounds. So that's why I actually juxtaposition, you know, juxtaposed the interesting uh, media installation. Because the media installation is really about sound, falling water. Okay, so this is so this is the kind of beginning introductions. And the next page. So this is for uh, the weird thing. I'm going to talk about uh, history of modern and contemporary art with some few important examples that explores the relationship between letters, words, and images. But particularly, let me begin with the letters. And on the left, it's by Kim ki -chan. I homogenize most Korean artists' names with their last name at the back, at the end of their name. So it's called Kim ki -chan. And the title of this work is Mumbang Sao. It refers to the old male aristocratic and elitist traditions of using these four main mechanism artistic materials to create calligraphic drawings. Okay, paper, brush, lightning, and ink. These are the four, you know, friends of this male elite during the Joseon dynasty up until the 19th century. This is really a typical way of juxtaposing those images. You can see the four, uh, the friends of the elite writers and, you, and also the writing in the back. This is more like a typical way of juxtaposing images of words in traditional um, calligraphic drawings. And on the right is a Soseo. I brought here this because it's pictogram. So you can see the edge represents something. So it's not strictly the letter, but it has the dual function of being looked like letters that also has some signification and is a very individualistic creation. And also like this work because it represents some of the underlying humanism that the Mudinwa, say, you know, uh, traditional elitistic uh, writing versus uh, drawings, wanted to represent because it represents the human, human figure. So it's not exactly letter, but it has its own function, but it certainly moves away from a typical letter. In the next page, this is a long quote. Everything is in Korean. But let me briefly explain how the early modernists who had you know, worked from the 1920s up until the 1960s and 70s still withheld this long tradition of calligraphic drawings, not just in terms of a static sense, but also in terms of the philosophical sense. And he said, we all come from a calligraphic tradition. He's just familiar with this traditional black ink. And also black ink is a medium for writing, not just for drawing. So there's a kind of uh, interesting juxtaposition, as well as the dual tradition that had existed all along the way, up until the beginning of the modern art in South Korea. And the next page. 
And this is the Pan Yi Kim. He's a very famous figure. Um, I'm really uh, not happy to show the PPP in this way, but it's really, really made of beautiful colors. As you can see on the left, it is really originated from a Chinese character. But certainly, the background is a red. It's a very beautiful red, so that you can see the interesting way that the artists pursue visually. There's a formal elements and pursue uh, this arrangement of letters in the really simplified the red background. Of course, on the right, there are less certain quality in terms of the uh, nature of these letters. I'm not so sure that we can call these images on the right as the letters. It's more like drawings, more like a children's pictogram. But certainly, uh, like Matisse, juxtaposition of different, but very basic hues, <coughs> he begins to arrange the different forms and try to create some patterns out of the basic ingredients of letters. So there's an interesting picture for us. And I will try to say uh, that coming out of the traditions of calligraphic drawings, there's all these generations of modernist painters in South Korea uh, kind of use the letters or basic letters or the patterns of letters uh, and then make them as a unit to pursue the forms, the pure forms. The next page. And I also brought uh, this interesting images. One is on the left is the Subban Park, and one on the right is the Kim Jong-yang. Uh, they both belongs to the, the Ali Mananas. And this relatively only work, especially the Subban Park's work, is uncertain, but the, the still is work created during the 1950s. He was a very interesting painter. He's known for surface effect. And some argument, uh, some argues that his surface, very thick material and, 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 and unsmooth quality of his painter touches uh, kind of is a reminiscence of the Havana, like traditional Korean stones, and then you have some more like nationalistic interpretation that uh, this very unsmooth surface kind of uh, represents the very poverty stricken the post-war years in South Korea because it's during the 1950s and the Korean War um, took place between 1950s and 53. Another interesting thing about the work on the left is that it's a Huminjong. It's a Korean letters, not Chinese letters. Because so far, we kind of see that some of the only modernist uh, Korean painters used or began with the Chinese letters. But you can see this is the Korean letters. Um, and on the right, the Kim Jong-un also uh, reshaped the Kyo Nin, the basic Korean Hun Min Jong-un, as the basis uh, for his sculpture. I don't think you're not familiar with the Korean Hun Min Jong. That's exactly the words that I'm using. And it was invented like, you know, during the 13th century under the Joseon dynasty. And what's interesting about uh, for the Korean Hun Min Jong is this is really based upon the sound. It's like, a, you know, the alphabet. Western author, it's just the base of the sounds. Not, you know, not like, uh, unlike Chinese letters, which is based upon the pictograms combined with uh, some signification system. So it's really different types of the uh, alphabet. But it's still kind of still part of the, I guess, the formalistic pursuit of separating the letters and treat it as it is rather than as a means of uh, communicating ideas. And the next page. Uh, I wrote this Nam Wan's uh, work. He is considered to be one of the earliest uncle male artists. He studied in France, 
what I really like about this work is that he began to put himself into this um, drawing. There's kind of revival of calligraphic traditions. In other words, he's kind of, uh, you know, segments, each letters or patterns. It's not exactly letters, but there's kind of tendency of treating each unit as a letter. But then, he not only pursued the visual arrangement of forms and uh, uh, sort of like juxtaposition between the, the space that is entirely filled or space that is the void. But also you can see that there's a dynamicism. You can hear the music almost. I really like this, the beginning of the artist, a folkman artist to, uh, to put themselves, put their powers in it so that lines are flowing. So you can see that some of the energies that the artist had applied. Next. So this one is not well perceivable from a distance, but this is a Paxobos and Couture. He's very kind of comparable to uh, Yi Fan, the more well-known, international well-known artist. Yi Fan and Paxobos was in really close contact with each other during the 1980s and the 90s. What was interesting thing about is that this kind of, there's no letters, but French title is écriture, that means writing. So instead of working with the visual forms of letters per se, these artists just to reenact the whole actions of writing, very consistent, repetitive. It's almost like self-discipline and method of keep going on, repeating himself. So this is really not about the, the, the final form itself, but more about the process. And also compared to the Nam Chung Pai, more famous artist, I guess the most famous artist among the contemporary Korean artists. And it's called Ejong Mani. Love is one ten thousand miles. I really like this uh, Nam Chung Pai's somewhat awkward quality, he's actually wanted to transform the television into something different. So he put some like, uh, I really wish you could see the rear, the PPD that I have actually brought it. It's really flesh color, it's a pink color inside. So you can see he just to try to put some heart, not only symbolic sense, but also literary sense, because it's a blinking. And then it puts some you know, a little bit kitsch phrase uh, coming from old traditional saying that the ejo, right, the law, is a something that goes on and on. So we actually see some differences from the left word because the left, Paxabos word, doesn't really have any meanings. In fact, I mean, it's really about him writing some repetitive marks. It becomes significant, whereas on the right, he really puts some um, words, now it's not just the letters, it's just the words, expressions, and wunjang, it's like sentence. And under next. So now I'm actually beginning to talk about that it's no longer just the form, it's no longer just the form or pursuit of the letters or uh, the words, it's really about how particular words or expression that artists have used can have some meaning within the context of a particular artistic movement. On the left is Oyun, his very, very famous artist. Uh, we call him uh, as a part of the Minjun Museum, which is called the People's Art. Of course, this kind of, this, who are the peoples? Of course, it's more like an ideologically driven term. So here's the people, something related to the working class, proletarian, and also some kind of nationalist agendas going on. He directly quotes the Song of Sword. Song of the Sword is a song written by the, some like Kurtic figure of Tonga. Tonga is the late Joseon dynasty of the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century, sort of like Kurtic you know, religious belief 
that the Korea should move, move ahead and fight against the whole influences from the outside world, particularly you know, the capitalism and Western empiricism. It was the, during the 20th century. I guess in the end, Kircher has also a lot of history of post-colonialism. So it's really kind of a Korean type of the uh, history of colonialism. Uh, oh, you, oh, in 1980, far later than the early 20th century, we adopted this kind of very famous poetry by Chen Jie, uh, Chen Jie uh, from Tonga. So the idea is this, like, we just cut it, like with a sword, to any, any randomness of overpowering or uh, predicament that the South Korean society has to face at the time, because you have a huge influence of capitalism and military dictatorship in the 1980s. So here, the whole world, it's not just a form of pursuit, it's really about social criticism. I juxtapose all your threads along with Yun Song Nam's work. Uh, you can't really read it. I can't even read it. On the, on the bottom, you can see the whole writing by Chen Yang. It's like a feminist boy, and it's very strong words. So, the idea is I kind of commit myself to move away from that on to live a very different life. So it's not just the visual elements per se, it's kind of that is the point. The whole point is that it becomes the part of the uh, design. The next. So then, you know, you, you got the point. I really wanted to pursue, it's not just the formulas per se, but it's really about the meaning. And on the left is by Oima. It's quite, Shocking at the time, uh, I didn't know so much about what, the gay or you know, lesbian art in India, but he uh, chose some of the names, cafes, the restaurants, the places that the male gay people get together. So it's quite shocking. Of course, it's really delicate, elegant. The other thing is it's all letters written with the incense. So it can be burned. So it's kind of installation on the floor, and it's not really performed that way all the time because you have to be kept with you know fire. But what happens is that when you actually lit up, it really has a smell. So remember, as I told you at the beginning, the visual artists always work with the sound and the smells. So we can feel the smell. So they kind of more quieted, and the meditative qualities involved with facing the artwork that has an incense and the burning that also brings up some sadness related to the existence of these male gay people in South Korean society. And in the middle, this is a little bit more tricky. The wool spoon, I don't know so much about it, but in South Korea there's a lot of debate about the, how youth people have to survive in society, so much were the gaps of uh, upper class and the lower class. So there is a very humorous thing, in some ways self-depreciated comment. So there's a little bit of fun going on. It's more like an anim you know, animation type of quick writing. And the color is very kind of candy color. And uh, also this kind of sound. It's more like a, uh, the painting, but it has some, some cinematic quality. It's like a conversation. And on the right, I just to show it to you in order to see how it works. He, you can see the whole flow of writing, but it's really kind of mundane. It's wususu. It's the sound of the leaves falling down from the trees. It's not considered to be so deep and philosophical. But there's a lot of sound quality going on. It's the kind of fun quality and going on in almost a touristic thing. So this is the, uh, again, interesting light combinations of forms, but has a deep social and critical message on the line to this uh, interesting calligraphic drawings. So, so far, you know, I begin with a formalistic arrangement 
by a modernist painter through the 1960s until the 1980s and 90s. And then we move to how this kind of uh, adjustment or transformations of letters and uh, words become related to some of the social issues as Korean society actually moves along. And the next page. Yeah, so that's just the really the time. I think the four, you know, as the three artists, South Korean artists, are sitting in front of the audiences, why don't we actually give us a big <laughs> Yeah, I'm the only one who has this flowers. <laughs> so you will have the flowers later too. And yeah, you should give them too. I, I, I'm not really creating something, right? <laughs> and let me begin with the Yongsun song. Again, the last name, I place the last one at the back of, at the end of the name. And second is Okun Kim, and third is Hegan Kim. And Hegan Kim, uh, who is the media artist, could not, you know, join our team due to her personal circumstances. And let's move on to the first artist, Yongsun. Yes, next. Yongsun Sa. Um, he's certainly oldest from our group and most respected. And there's so many to um, there's so many ways to sum up his work. He has his work uh, that took place from the 19, you know. Uh, late 1980s up until today, so it's going to be more than six years, you know, six years, six decades of his artwork. But let me just use this opportunity to just to focus on word and images because it's a unique perspective to look at him. He is a part of the, you know, people's art, so he's always painting something related to the socialist realism. But I really like but I really like his work about the city person, the what would like urban dwellers, most likely urban class people in metropolitan area, but particularly from uh, the wait, uh, late 2000 and up until the last decades, he began to portray the people around the world, urban dwellers, working class people around the globe. That really attracts me because whenever he paints something, you can see the small signpost, like, you know, 34th Street, 14th Street, so location, regional locations of signpost in his a lot of uh, realistic painting. And you see on the right is New York City subway. He took a lot of images from the subway station. And in the middle, you can see the 14th Street. One well, really interesting thing to think for the urban travelers, we really become accustomed to our environment and become really systematically, in a way, homogenizedly categorized as it is. And look at us. The people working and living in the city accustomed to and doesn't really feel uncomfortable with. In fact, we should really think about our existence, which is constantly categorized by a certain system. And the fact is, the next page, the system becomes very commonly found. It's all over the world, but at the same time, there's a little bit of differences. We have to question this idea about globalism, and I really like this whole sign that, uh, that is recognizable. You know, we can't really read it, right? On the left is a Spain bus New Jersey, so I guess it's English, and there's a lot of Hispanics living there, so Latin words is there. But we can easily imagine what it is like, because whole sign post system in our transportation and urban design look so much look alike to each other. So we really have to question about our own tradition, which you know is and especially if you consider the migration worker, we really have to question about how capitalism in a global way control the people's living conditions. 
And on the right is also some letters he found from the Beijing cross station. But also, I like about how he structured, how place figures in the background. It's like almost a sentence. You have a word and arrange it to make a sentence. You have each individual place, and they have their own function and place in their own places, positions, such as the bus driver, a position in a particular way, and the sitters in a certain woman, the man, you know, children, supposed to sit in a certain way. And I really like this kind of structure, you know, way of organizing whole layout of the screen picture play. He talks about the relations. It's about the human relations. But how about the sentence? It's really about the relationships. It's not just the words per se. If you look at certain words, then you can place it within a particular sentence. You begin to realize that the new meaning arises. So I think it's really interesting to see how he placed this individual as the part of the cult in a big deal. But at the same time, within this whole system, they're working as a kind of H words, like you know, H figures is placed in the background and they're part of the urban landscape as much as the each word is situated in the sentence. Look okay, next page. So this is a, his, I just recorded from some of the, his interview. Um, and I really like this small, interesting drawing, Mago the Myth. Because the whole idea that I found from his interview is that he always liked to connect the dots. So you can't see the dots, but you can clearly see that he wanted to make a mark. And the mark, and mark actually connected by lines, and another mark's connected to the lines. As much as we actually create uh, our own idea and making up some sentences, as we begin with a small idea, the small figures connected to each other. And so I really like this uh, more structural similarity about how to actually combine the sentence. Uh, the, the, all your page, previous page. And then you can see how his painting is well structured in a warm color and a blue color. So there's a lot of interesting arrangement going on. The next, next. You know, so I really wish I could show you that it's a very bright red very bright blue. So it's not gloomy, you know. So he has a very great compositional skills. It's very structured, which really reminds me of some of the very well-structured sentences. That's a really interesting part for me, because oftentimes when we compare the word and image, it's rather simple. But here's much more uh, this cognitive, cognitive understanding and pattern that comes together with some visual static arrangement. And the next, uh, this is the Elvin Humes. He has an interesting identity, dual identity. One is a media artist and the other is a painter. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I really would like to have this lecture with this this is my first time in my life. And so, yeah. Right, right. Um, he choose, he used to decode, you know, coding system. And he is the media artist. And he chose some keywords from some newspaper that he found throughout the 2018. And some of the words relate to the nuclear, nuclear threats. One most commonly, you know, cited thing is Jong Un Kim, as always, the North Korean leader, and also there's a lot of political debates about the nuclear plants uh, in South Korea. So these are really heavy terms. What's interesting thing is that if you look at this work, it's very poetic. So the word keyword itself is not that poetic. It's very heavy-handed. It's really militar militaristic and serious terms. But if you look at it, 
it's poetic, and also it's interactive work. So the, if the artist actually, the audience is, is getting closer to the screen, the whole speed of falling uh, of the letters, or words, usually keywords, uh, become slower. So that when you get closer to the screen, you can see it, you can read it. But if you actually uh, move away from the screen, it moves quite quickly. He explains that, but that's how we actually approach the whole uh, information in this kind of media-saturated world. We kind of bombarded with the words, and we oftentimes ignore it. But once we actually take the time, we just kind of look at closely. The other thing about it is that uh, he wanted to say how quickly all these keywords kind of disappearing. It just faded from our brain. So as we walk a distance, walk away from the screen, or, you know, the keywords faded quite quickly. We just kind of Google it, forget about it. So the title is A Living Information. And the next page. So this is the whole things that I, you know, summarize it in the next. Uh, this is a painting. I mean, there's one side that if we can use this, the whole words, as a definitely as kind of documentation of social reality or daily reality. At the same time, he wanted to pursue uh, his role as a healer of society. He emphasizes his horizontal line and mentions about uh, uh, the girth. I happen to know that Gwalio has also the girth. Yeah, he's coming from Suncheon, the area that has a girth. So the idea is that uh, he wanted to bring out this very quiet and uh, peaceful painting, especially emphasizing uh, this uh, horizontal line, as opposed to what we have seen is kind of vertical line. That's kind of something that have the information or social conflicts kind of combined, bombarded us, as opposed to this image of horizontality, that kind of way to heal yourself. He's actually living within um, the very, in the natural environment, which is really rare for a lot of South Korean. South Koreans are, most of South Koreans are living in the urban area. So, right, so there's an interesting juxtaposition of verticality, horizontality. Um, and the third, next, is Hebyeon Kim, who's the only female artist of course, it's not necessarily a good way to explain it, but we, the women artists, the women critic has to celebrate ourselves. <laughs> Next page. And I happened to share the bathroom, so, and I also took a long night train from New Delhi. Uh, I haven't really figured out so much about the prehistoric you know, anthropological uh, knowledge, but let me try. Uh, she's really interested in um, prehistoric writing. Her education took place in Germany. She used the wonderful painting, a very expressive painting uh, in South Korea, in Berlin. She had wonderfully, very well received exhibitions in, in, in Berlin um, three or four times after two or three three decades of painting, she began to move on to this very simple pictograms, to put it really uh, simply. And uh, she's really interested in a prehistoric drawing because it has a pattern, but it doesn't really have a specific meaning or very structured grammatical you know, system that we have. But at the same time, this is the really the, the human beings, as we imagine, trying to find a way to find the meaning or social cause. So the title is Art and Code. The Korean Bronze Mirror. It's like a bronze period, I guess, to two more than 2,000 years ago. And then uh, she kind of tried to find some similarity. So there's a kind of former pursuit, but it always began with some of the rock joints anthropologically found rock drawings. Next page. Right. Uh, she's really interested in that how the people's actually making 
horizontal line and vertical line. I repeat, make the patterns. So everything is really processional. And the other thing is that there's no predetermined code. So this is like they begin to writing without really clear roadmap. So it's like a creative process of making up the new patterns, which they hope will be communicable. Next page. And there's a lot of industry. So she actually begins with South Korean for historic writing. She did a really anthropological research. I mean, she really did a tremendous job in efforts to make a documentation. And then she go to the north of the Korean Peninsula and then touches upon the Middle Asia. And she follows some, the similar pattern of historic writing. Am I right? right? And then now, she's in the process of going further west of going down. And further west to um, Caucasus and Georgia, she told me, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's always the dual, right, the regional names. So she really wanted to figure out to see how the human beings, despite all differences of national culture boundary, they have a similar universal desire to find some patterns. And there's just some, like, pleasure involved with it. But she wanted to see it, how people actually find something common as well as different from each other. And then now she's, she's trying to come, come down. This is the right time for her to visit here to find some connection with Indus Valley, right? Somebody should correct me. Indus Valley uh, tradition, Parapapa, and Tamil Nadu rock drawing. So that's what she's actually getting at, at this point. Next. So this all looks like painting, drawing, but she always wanted to find some repetitive patterns. Next. The next. Yes, this is the, something that you can find from the outside of this building. The next. And she did a lot of research. She sent me whole this referential images. Uh, I hope, I hope that I can have that, you know, have a better understanding. I'm really ashamed of it because I'm our historian, but I'm so trained in contemporary art, you know, I kind of get rid of all this like for historic. But I will just like, catch up with it. The next page. Um, this is like a pattern. So she kind of have realistic, you know, drawings that become simplified, get to some patterns, and she wanted to figure out how people's come up with the basic alphabetical things. She also mentions about how uh, the Panikians, right, they invented a, a traditional Western alphabet, but the Western alphabet was also a combination of some of the influence of uh, Mesopotamia, uh, the, the Judah, some like Middle Eastern kind of influence kind of uh, uh, work together. So this is a good way to look at the transcultural uh, elements of our culture. The next page, uh, the Hengen Han, she's not here. Uh, she's a really, really wonderful artist. Uh, she's the youngest. Uh, it's her first work. Her interest is always about locality, place, and images, and very simple description of particular places. She, is, she was raised in a relatively remote area of Kangwondo in South Korea. And she, she's really a movie, like fanatic. And she told me that whenever she saw everything in the movie, it's not her place, it's somebody else's place. So she, her first work was the, the video where it's made of this postcard. This all postcard has fantastic images, like nostalgic images and simple description that she had never you know, visited before. So this is about uh, a lonely-hearted hunter. It's sort of, she always identified herself as a, some lonely figure who was a trapped in a home, but always looking for somewhere else. But she also got a lot of information from the postcards, the magazine, as well as the internet. Next page. Then she actually worked with this 
very blank screen. So the upper part is the morning, morning has broken. And then there's no image. And then only there's a sound implying the man waking up and go outside of the you know, building. There's you know, door sounds. And walk down the street, aisles, and then taking the car. So it's very simple. And she gives a very simple sound. So it's not that difficult. But we don't want who actually creates some story on it. So she always try to get rid of some information. So it's not just about simple letters or words, but it's really about how we kind of naturally create our own image out of certain words, out of certain sounds. The bottom part is that uh, it's about a conversation. She also liked the how people cannot communicate with each other. So there's a very simple conversation, but nothing really happens. But there's some atmospheres there. So she always thinks we can't communicate with the images, with the conversation. So she really gathered up some of the information. The third, this is the last, yeah. And this is the work that will be shown at uh, Zaipur uh, Art Summit. Uh, this is all made of her foot footage or footage found on the internet. It's all jumbled together. The title is the, A Small Island That Called Peace. It's the same thing. I mean, she always thinks, what is your peaceful place? this whole juxtaposition of different images. And she doesn't really give a lot of interpretation. So it's us who kind of put our interpretation. So there's a like, very range of images from you know, 14th and 15th century uh, European painting. You see the Ellis Island, everyday images. So it's just like uh, she actually created a whole series of video works over the like two decades. And what she ended up with is just the leftover images. She created a new work from the leftover images. And then there's a constant, very simple line that kind of makes you go to these images. So it's really about your interpretation. So the last page. So that it's all works about how our image and words fails us. We all cannot communicate properly. But that really gives a new possibility for a visual artist, for us to re-actually interpret it, our own understanding of the letters, former qualities, or how we interpret the socially critical messages, or how we understand everyday images that we take from the magazine and the internet. So this is really the good place for contemporary artists to continue to pursue. And this is how contemporary, modern, and Korean artists, including the four wonderful artists that were participating at this Zagru Summit, will pursue. Thank you.